Okay, good. So welcome back. And today we will be talking about something quite interesting, uh, which is motivation and emotion in decision making. But before that, as uh, always, so we have something called this decision making decision neuroscience warm up. So what do we have discussed from the last time? The topic from the last time is uh, one of the four main topics in these four weeks. So the topic is about risky decision making and intertemporal choice. The question, the main, the central question about risky decision making and intertemporal choice is that what is the risk and why the intertemporal choice and risky decision making can be related. So why we group these two together when we were introducing uh, the topic. So the idea behind the risky decision making and intertemporal decision making is uh, uh, the common the commonality is is the uncertainty part, right? So the uncertainty is the commonality that is quite crucial for both the risky decision making and the intertemporal decision making. So suppose that you have zero percent chance to get one euro, so you know you have zero percent chance. There is no uncertainty. So the risk there is no risk. If I say you have 100% chance to get one euro, there's also no risk because this is something for sure. And what is uncertain is if I say you have 50% of the chance to, to win one euro. So in this case, um, it's, it's quite uncertain because you have no idea whether or not you will get uh, the one euro. So another uh, perspective is to calculate the expected value when we were discussing the risky decision making the expected value in the risky decision making is simply to multiply the probability with the, the amount of money so if i say you have 50 50 percent of the chance to win one euro that means 50 percent multiplied with one so you get 50 cents so on average half of the time you will win one euro some Half of the time, half of the time, you get nothing. So on average, you get uh, fifty cents. Risk uh, uncertainty is also in intertemporal decision making. It is because something that happens in the future is pretty uncertain. So this uncertainty is described or uh, quantified by time. So by the time delay. So in risky decision making, uh, uncertainty is quantified by probability. And in intertemporal choice, the, the uncertainty is quantified by, by time, by the time window. So this is something yeah, that you might want to keep in mind uh, when talking about the, the two types of decision making. <clears throat> good. I guess that's a good summary. And we will move on something called uh, emotion and motivation in decision making. So if I ask you, if I ask you to make a decision, uh, again, using the example of the smoothie and the chocolate brownie, so you are presented with the choice and you are about to make a choice. So you might have some, some kind of evaluation in your mind. We talk about value-based decision making, right? You think subjectively which values more, which values less, and you might choose the option that you value more. But if be in between the uh, the biology, what might be happening in your brain, what we are talking about neuroscience, right? So in between what might be happening in your brain and the actual behavior, that might be something in between. So uh, you have to consider the motivations of why you are doing this decision and you might have some emotion, right? If you are on a good day, maybe both of the choices you are happy with. If you are on a bad day and you feel a little bit down, and if I give you something quite tasty, you are not really feeling. You do not really feel feel like eating eating anything because the emotion is quite important that might affect our day to day behavior. So we are now talking about emotion and motivation in decision making. So emotion is up to now as as so as as up to now there is still not yet a quite clear kind of definition because some people say uh, emotion is continuous so even though we, we can name emotion by, by different names we can term them by different names we can say there's fears anger and uh, joy and the disgust that, that's the name we, we give the name it's arbitrary name by, by researchers or by by the culture by the society but it might be 
a continuous thing. So each emotion is a um, entity on the continuous scale. But some others say it's not continuous. It's just discrete. These six are, are, are just the basic emotions, and then they they are independent of each other. There's nothing related. They are just discrete emotions. But anyway, we we have some kind of knowledge about um, emotion. So if I do have to give you a definition, because we are in this Bachelor of Psychology um, uh, seminar, I, I cannot really say, well, I don't know how to define emotion, right? Because there are at least some, some efforts that is trying to define emotion. So you can imagine emotion is something like a state of feeling that has cognitive, ph physiological, and behavioral uh, components. So what is important about uh, emotion is, uh, is the valence. So valence is one criteria used in some definitions of emotion, not every, uh, not every definition. So valence describes uh, the, 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 the positiveness or the negativeness. So the positive versus negative. So uh, if um, the valence is positive, then we are, we are talking about some positive emotions like joy, like happy. If we are talking about negative valence, then the emotion here we are talking about is, for example, like anger or fear, right? So valence is, in many of the definitions, very important. So this is like one of the, the most, this most used term, valence, to describe emotion in a uh, research area, okay? It's positive versus negative. Good. And if we know that, we can imagine what can be, uh, what uh, the positive versus negative emotions are in, in daily research or in daily life, basically. So reward can be positive, can, can give you, could give you, could bring you a uh, positive emotion uh, versus Punishment. Punishment is on the other side, so it is a negative valence, right? So that's my, that punishment might give you might be very likely to give you negative emotion. So what else? So certainty. Then it's surely versus uncertainty or risk that we talked about earlier a few, few minutes ago. So certainty. If you know something uh, for sure, the, the the event is happening for sure. You, you know about it. If something. You have no idea if the university will be opening or not. There is a huge uncertainty. So maybe that will bring you some negative emotion. And this actually indeed happens for a few people out there. <clears throat> so then there is joy versus effort and uh, everything like um, uh, related to that. Okay, good. Okay, I guess this is quite kind of a motiv in short introduction of motivation. I, I do not want to spend too, long, too much time on that because you will see uh, more examples in the presentations that will be happening in a few minutes. Uh, so today, there are two, two topics, right? One is the uh, uh, emotion and the other, one, the other one is motivation. So, so why, why am I again putting two things together which seems related, but where is the connection? So where motivation and emotion can be connected? So this is, uh, that, this is what we are trying to do now as a simple or short introduction. So the psychology of motivation is concerned with the why of the behavior. So if, if I choose a chocolate brownie versus a cucumber smoothie, so why am I doing that? What is the motivation that underlies this behavior? So why, why am I doing this behavior, right? If we ask, if we recruit participants into the lab, we ask them, we ask them to make choices, we ask them to, do something that's uh, in our experiment, we might just wonder why they are doing this, right? So what is the motiv motivation of the behavior? And here is the link, the connection between motivation and the emotions. The emotion is often the driving force behind motivation. So the, the behavior is not always, but some of the time, which is actually often, is um, that the behavior is affected by, by emotion. And then the emotion is the driving force of the motivation, and then you observe the behavior. Examples can be that why, why do we eat? Because we're hungry, because we want to survive, or maybe something like uh, pizza is tasty, and we want to eat also gelato, for example. So, so why, why do we eat? So this, there can be different reasons, right? For surviving reasons or for enjoying reasons. 
Some say also like why do most people like football because it's, it's because it is exciting, right? And this is quite a controversial example in the field of emotion research or motivation research. It is, you know, football or soccer for there are people in North America. So it, this could produce some quite strong emotional um, effects to the audience if you support a team if the team wins you will have a huge positive emotion that you might enjoy for a long time the entire evening you will just be very happy right be very delighted because the, the team has won against the rivalry for instance so we talk about the negative valence negative valence emotion might be something that we would like to avoid however the negative emotion here related to football or any kind of sports or soccer it is it's 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 hard to say because um, if your team loses, you, you, are, you are quite sad, but um, you kind of, some, some, some football supporters at least, they kind of enjoy this sadness. So even though the team lost against some rivalry, uh, they're very sad, they are, they're very down for the entire night, but they can somehow turn this negative emotion to something pretty, positive honestly because they might think okay the next time the team will win because now there's this player that player who did not play very well so they are trying to use this one as a as a as a induction and then they could produce some quite interesting behavior so here what i'm trying to say is in this example of football or soccer both the positive and the negative emotion they are super strong and they really produce interesting behavior in, in everyday life so another example here is what are the pro-social motivations? We, we know that people are independent of each other if um, they are not in, within the same family, but people do help strangers, for example. But why, why is this behavior? What is motivation? Why do some, some of uh, the people they, they help the others, strangers, for example? And uh, also example is why are some people aggressive? Some people, they are just tend to be aggressive, but why is that? What, what is the, the motivation? What might be something happened in, in their history that's caused or affected this behavior? Good. And one special kind of motivation is uh, called apathy. I call it motivation, but in fact, the definition is there's no motivation. There is a lack of motivation or interest or enthusiasm. So I do not want to do anything. That called empathy, apathy. So I can't be just bothered. I just want to lay down. I have no motivation to do anything. I'm just in the apathy state of life. So why am I talking about apathy? It is because in one of the presentations you will see, they really talk about apathy. So that's why I had to give you a short introduction of apathy. So to give you a much more uh, formal introduction or uh, definition, instead of lack of lack of motivation, so apathy is related to a reduced goal-directed behavior, no uh, loss of pleasure, something like that. It is connected or associated with long-term un unemployment. So this is quite something um, relevant to the society, right? So it is also associated with later life, ill health, so illness, and or poor educational outcomes. Okay, good. And now we know there are two concepts. One is emotion, the other one is motivation. Okay, then we want to study emotion and uh, motivation in experimental tasks in the laboratory. So in our psycho psychology de psycholo the department of psychology. So how to study that? So to study emotion and, uh, and motivation, so we have to do, to design experiments to work on, to induce, to uh, manipulate emotion or motivation. So one way is to, um, to employ, to apply a technique called emotion induction. So most of the time is to give videos to the participants. If uh, we give the participants a comedy and it will be quite different, then if we give the participant to watch some other genre of, of movie. Okay. So uh, another one is another technique is called feedback manipulation. So for example, uh, if you think 
that you are very good at, at mathematics. You are good at calculating things and uh, uh, you're very good at that. But for example, if I give you some really simple mathematic problems, if you do it, you think you did pretty well, but I always just give you negative feedback. And then how would you feel? So this is to give you uh, a manipulated feedback to induce some of the, uh, the emotion or motivation. I'm not sure if how many of you have participated in some ongoing studies before the close down. There are some stress related study. So basically, no matter how well you do, you always get kind of neutral phase and um, or even negative feedback. So this really induces stress to the participants. And then this can be tested by their, uh, uh, by their, uh, by their cortisol level, right? <clears throat> Good. So th those are the techniques. And then how to measure that? And the one measure is to measure their, their willingness. So if subjective willingness on a scale between nine to, between zero and nine, how uh, would you, how you are, you are willing to do something or not on the, on a scale. So they give the number, right? This is subjective a little bit. What is not so subject, subjective is we could measure their response time, their reaction time. So if they're really motivated, they might just click on the button as fast as possible because they're really motivated. However, if they are less motivated or even like in the apathy state, maybe their reaction time is longer relative to when they are motivated. So this thing can, can be combined, right? One condition is there is a stress induction group. Another condition is like normal condition. And we can measure how the stress induction could affect both the willingness and the, the response of the participants. Some other thing can be measured is effort. So how much effort, physical effort, you would like to exert at the strength, the physical strength during some task. If you're motivated, you would like to push as hard as you can, squeeze a bar, for example. If you're not really motivated, maybe you do not really want to squeeze any, uh, at not, if you do not want to squeeze at all. So um, again, lack of motivation. Good. I think that is in fact uh, my part of introduction. So any questions? before we have we go into the individual the paired presentation everything's clear i guess good